always better to start off with a little applause. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I feel very honored to be here and um, be able to speak about one of um, my favorite uh, topics today with you, with um, another community that has a lot to offer, like um, I talked with Lydia before and I read a lot about um, what you're doing um, and I find it pretty intriguing. And so thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Claudia Garat. Uh, I'm the executive director of Wikimedia Austria which is the local chapter of the Wikiverse. So we uh, support the volunteers that um, work for Wikipedia and her sister projects here in Austria. Uh, mainly we work closely together with Wikimedia Germany, where Lydia works, for example, um, and uh, the Central and Eastern European communities um, on the other side. So this is where I come from. This is what I do. Um, and I'm here today to talk a bit about um, the welcoming culture in our projects and the Wikimedia projects. Uh, and perhaps um, the one or the other idea or one or the other things that we learned in the last couple of years or we tried might also be interesting for you because as I heard, like one of the three goals is onboarding newcomers and I think welcoming culture and newcomers um, need to go together very well. So, Wikipedia, I think everybody in this room knows what Wikipedia is, right? So um, I don't have to ask this question. So if we see this iconic W, um, this is um, what encyclopedia, for us, is what the encyclopedia nowadays looks like. It's um, our version of what used to be the Bockhaus in the German-speaking world or the Encyclopedia Britannica in the um, Anglophone world before. Uh, it's, it's a website where everybody can access knowledge at any time on their mobile phones, on their computers, and uh, and I don't have to say that to you because you're a community yourself, but to many people I talk to, it's actually a kind of a surprise that this is not just a website with some uh, content that comes from somewhere, um, but it's actually um, way more than that. It's a community or even more uh, a network of communities because every language, Wikipedia, has their own little sub culture, sub community, and then there are all the sister projects like Wikidata, like Wikivoyage. Um, like Wikimedia Commons. And uh, what brings all these people together is the belief that knowledge belongs to all of us. Uh, and that not only means that it belongs to all of us in the sense that we can access it for free at any time, anywhere, like to have free educational content for everybody, but also that we are all agents of knowledge. All of us carry knowledge and we are all should be part of the creation of knowledge. It's not only um, the ivory tower as it used to be for so many years where some scientists or experts say what, um, what is the status quo of, um, of a given topic, but um, each and any of us can contribute to that and this is what um, revolutionized the way we create and consume knowledge nowadays. The big W with that is also a symbol for what's actually possible in the online age where a lot of the promises that um, were inherent in the birth of internet actually came true and like one of it and this is also something that I probably don't have to tell you but for many who have never lifted the curtains and looked behind the Wikipedia universe um, it's the power of decentralized collaboration that it's actually possible to create something like Wikipedia without any formal structure or hierarchy that people just work together and form this body of knowledge and um, uh, that's actually pr pretty beautiful. Like for me, that's um, one of the biggest social experiments of mankind in a way. I, I don't think we ever had like a global experiment to that extent um, where we have so many different people from so many different backgrounds working together for one goal. And um, the issue with it is that uh, actually like we're also lacking uh, the series to explain how and why that's actually possible. And even people have been working in the Wikiverse for many, many years Here's user Raoul, for example, who um, said that like many years ago, um, of these quotes of laws of Wikipedia, the problem with Wikipedia is that it can only work in practice. In theory, it would never work. So we're lacking the motivational theories that say, like, why would people anonymously, without any gain for their reputation, or without any money, or, or any other like classical um, incentives, put so much time and effort into creating something like Wikipedia. We just don't have the um, sociological, motivational, organizational theories that come with it. So um, even for us, it's still a mystery how it exactly works, but um, it's a beautiful mystery to explore every day. So there is this place where people, like one of the few places, unfortunately, um, in the internet, in, in my regard, 
or in my view, uh, where we actually come together to create, where we're not only passive consumers who want to be entertained, who um, want to uh, be uh, served information, but we actually come together to also create information. And um, in the last couple of years, we realized that this is actually becoming more and more important in Wikipedia. The, uh, the W becomes a symbol for something um, quite important, um, and that is fact-based information. Like all of a sudden, what many of us took for granted for many years, that information should be as objective as possible, should be um, sourced um, in, in with should be um, sourced with um, really high quality sources um, became more and more of a uh, disputable issue all of a sudden. And so a lot of um, other platforms start turning to Wikipedia and the Wikipedia communities to see um, what we learned in the last almost 18 years um, when it comes to creation um, of knowledge uh, about um, dealing with sources, uh, about dealing with information on the internet. Uh, because uh, all of a sudden it becomes harder and harder for a lot of social media platforms and others to um, actually provide exactly that reliable information. And um, even more so, we have um, fewer and fewer places where our colliding worldviews actually meet. And um, this is, like for me, one of the big beauties of Wikipedia, that this is one of the few spaces where these filter bubbles, as they often call it, actually meet, have to meet, and have to negotiate a common truth, like, or at least um, a common understanding of the truth. Because uh, we have people from all spectres of the political um, universe, or philosoph philo philosophical um, topics, and they need to come together on the talk pages of the wikis um, and negotiate like, what is the common denominator that makes it to the article and in what, in, in, in what way. Um, and of course that can be quite ugly in some, um, in some instances. I'm not saying it's all always civilized and nice. But it, it, it's possible and there are like really nice um, and informative um, studies, uh, especially from the Anglophone world and the um, English Wikipedia, but I think it's true for many other language versions too, that you can see the more people work together um, to create a Wikipedia article, the less bias they have in their language. So you can see that it does something to people if they are forced to negotiate, to talk to each other, to listen to each other, and to come to a common conclusion on what makes it to the article and one, what not. And this is like so important and so rare nowadays. Um, because if you look at, I don't know, any given news outlet and at the, um, the comment section below an article, uh, it's, it's usually just an ugly downward spiral of um, insults and, um, and uh, toxic behavior that doesn't lead anywhere. So this, this is important that we have places like that. And there should be more. It should not only be Wikipedia. There should be more places like that out there. So all that to say, um, of course I'm convinced that my job is important, that uh, what our community does is important, and it's nice to talk about like how wonderful we are. Um, but these are like not the only conversations should, we should have, and probably also not the most important uh, conversation we should have. The most important conversation we should have is like, where do we still fail? Like, wh where where are our blind spots? Like, what are we not doing right? What do we need to do to actually live up to that promise also in the future? Um, and if we look at our own mission statement, so this is something that Jimmy Wales, the co-founder of Wikipedia, said years ago, and I think it's one of the few things that almost all volunteers would actually subscribe to. Um, a lot of things are debatable, but I think this, um, this sentence, imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share the sum of all knowledge. That's our commitment. I think that's something that most of us would subscribe to. But um, after thinking about it for just one or two uh, minutes, it's already like, oh, wait a second. We are not there yet, like we are actually very far from it because as some of you might know, um, the Wikiverse is um, a very homogeneous place. It's not the most diverse place on earth. So we are far from having every single human being there and we also are far from um, actually enabling these people if they wanted to come to actually participate. And this is a big problem because um, if we want Wikipedia or free knowledge in whatever form being it Wikidata, the future of how we access free knowledge um, to survive and, and be this, um, um, this beautiful place out there on the internet. We need more people, we need fresh people, we need um, more perspectives, we need people from all over the world. And at the moment this is like not really possible. And um, just talking from my own experience, um, as an executive director of um, a 
fairly successful Wikimedia organization, which um, high approval rates in our yearly community surveys. Um, I just read the other day again that people are concerned that somebody from outside the Wikiverse is leading this organization. This is after six years that I um, not only committed a lot of my professional time, but also a lot of private time. Like I only added in my spare private time um, because I'd, everything else would be uh, paid editing. I need to hear that um, I'm still being perceived as being outside of whatever definition of core group there is out there. And okay, like for me it's a job, I signed up to it, I have to keep up with a couple of things, so this is fine, but um, if I would be a volunteer, I would think twice whether I want to spend another six years doing that, if people say something like that about me. And we have this, um, these issues with a lot of um, different situations where people come into the Wikiverse, either online or offline, um, and encounter difficulties, barriers, socially or technically, um, so they are actually not able to um, work with us on this mission statement. So is the big W also a W that stands for welcome or not? Like, if we look at our own um, definition that we have out there, a welcome is a kind of greeting designed to introduce a person to a new place or situation and make them feel at ease. Um, the term can similarly also be used to describe a feeling of being accepted or part um, on the part of the new person. So do we actually accomplish that, making people accepted as part of our community um, or feel at ease? I don't think so. Um, and talking to newcomers over the last years when I worked with them, I don't think so. And even people who've been contributing for many years and um, come to international events often feel lost. Like if they don't come as part of a group, like you're the single only uh, Bulgarian that can come to Wikimania, you can be pretty lost. Like, and this is not because people are evil, but um, there are a lot of inside jokes. You probably don't speak English that well. Um, you, you're a bit shy. Like, well, what's happening? Like, you can spend five days um, together with your tribe and still not being able to make um, the most out of it or anything out of it, really, if, if the conditions are not set up in a way to enable you to actually contribute, to meet people, to connect to people, and to do something with them. And this is a cultural problem. So this is um, one of the hardest challenges that are out there. Even for classical organizations where you have like hierarchies and a challenge, and then you have some kind of leadership and they come up with like a good strategy for tackling that challenge and you try to do it. And even in these classical organizations, there goes the same culture it's strategy for breakfast. And it's so true. Like um, if you don't really, um, manage to do something about the culture, you can have the best strategy for whatever, it will fail. Um, and it's even harder for us because we live in this decentralized world of all these communities and we as chapters, as Wikimedia organizations, don't actually have any agency in the projects themselves. We don't make the rules there, that they are made by the communities. So our framework of action is even more limited than in these classical organizations. So it's tough, but that should not keep us from trying to do something. The first time uh, Wikimedia Austria and I, um, as the responsible person there, um, actually s started to think about it very systematically and strategically um, was when we hosted the Wikimedia Hackathon um, in Vienna last year. So it's probably very similar in many regards to um, what you guys are doing on, on your events. It's uh, the time where all the volunteers meet, but also the paid um, employees of the Wikimedia Foundation to come together and develop new tools to improve Media Wiki. Um, so it's a very international event, it's um, also diverse, uh, and we hosted it not only because hosting events is so, so much fun <laughs> and we had so much time on our hands, we also had a goal. We wanted to expand the technical part of our communities because here in Austria we have a lot of photographers and editors, but we could use um, a couple of more tech-savvy um, folks in, in our Austrian community. So we wanted to reach out to like-minded communities here in Austria, invite them to the hackathon and show them that there might be, you know, common, common things that we could work on, that it might be worthwhile investing time in, um, in the Wikiverse. And um, with all the experiences we had before, we knew, like, this is not happening by itself. You can't just bring people in and throw them um, together with 200 other people from all over the world and hope that um, it, it's going to work. It works for a couple of people. I'm not saying it, it's not possible. Like, there are outgoing people who just, you know, dive in and become part of it. But we can't take that for granted. We need to come up with, like, a more systematic approach on how we foster that. 
And we started to, um, uh, to think about it in many big and small ways. And because there were not really good practices without it within our uh, own communities, we started to reach out to other tech communities and see what they've been doing, like um, Rails Girls, uh, feminist tech circles in Vienna and Austria, uh, Jugendtakt, which is a youth coding initiative um, from Germany that's also um, done in uh, Switzerland and Austria, and looked into what they have in handbooks, rules, ideas, and tried to you know, compile the, the best things that we thought like, might make our events even better. And we had a lot of small and big things like gender neutral bathrooms um, or quiet zones where people, if they're just overwhelmed from socializing, can retreat. And it's a clear signal like, if I'm here, I don't want to be approached. I need to, an hour or two to you know, calm down and um, have a bit of peace of mind before I can go back into the, the big um, international beehive of, of coders. So we had all these little things. Um, we compiled it in a, um, in a handbook. Uh, the resources will be at the end of my slides, so perhaps this is something that um, you might find useful for big or small events you're hosting in your communities or um, for, for one of the next academies. But the heart of, of what we actually did was a mentoring program that we set up. Um, and this was a mentoring product that, that really took that word mentoring very seriously. It was not just like, hey, and that, that's been because other things have been done before. We had buddy systems where you were matching newcomers with all tens and like, hey, you're buddies, um, you have fun together this weekend, go ahead. That often, that was nice, that's a start, but often it didn't work because um, after the initial getting to know each other and exchanging a bit, it's, it can be a pretty high barrier if you see your old hand buddy working on something really, um, uh, are concentrated to go back to him and disturb him every 30 minutes to ask him a question on like, hey, how do I set up that fabricated task or, or uh, my install party here failed, like, can you help me? So what we wanted to have is mentors who actually came to the event to be mentors and mentors only, to dedicate their time only to the newcomers, not working on their own projects, but come with a project that they work on, but with the newcomers. Also coming up with ideas, because um, at least in the Wikiverse, I don't know about your community, but in the Wikiverse, it's really hard as a newcomer. You have all these opportunities and all these things that you could do, but it's completely overwhelming. You can spend a day just researching like where to start and where you can actually contribute. So have um, a group of mentors being there and saying, like, this is my project, this is what we do, this is uh, the skills that we need. Do you want to work with me on that? That worked fairly well. And also, and that's something we learned from the youth hackathon, I learned a lot from that youth hackathon. Like, you always think like, that's only for kids, but it works for adults just as much. It's how important it is to have a sense of accomplishment at the end of the weekend, right? Like, you spend three or four days together, you work hard, and then you go home, and there's just this little thing that needs to be finished, or this or that, and you probably will never do it because you encounter more problems. You're, you're running out of time, so it's really important to have something that you've accomplished and can present at the end of the hackathon and the showcase together with everybody else. That's, that's one of the most motivating things, I think, that you can take from an event. And we wanted to enable everybody who wanted to do that to be able to do that. So it was the job of the mentors to make sure that their team can accomplish something and present it at the end of the three days um, together with all the old hands um, and stand in front of everybody and be proud of something and show it. Um, and that worked fairly well. Uh, we also had a program, a mentoring program coordinator to coordinate the mentors, to help them with the kickoff sessions, to um, help them uh, connect to each other during the days, have regular check-ins because you encounter problems when you mentor sometimes, so just exchange with other mentors, find other people with the right skill set somewhere, um, and um, have a regular communication also between the mentors over the three days. Um, and that being facilitated by um, a person that has just this role to look that the program itself is running well. Um, another important thing that only popped up, so that's something that we learned or we find in process, so to say, um, during the, um, the event was that it's uh, nice to have a mentoring area because um, usually you have the kickoff session and people spread out and work on their own or in little groups and they come back together, but it's sometimes at big events hard to find the persons back that you needed or sometimes just anybody who can help you. So to have like this assigned area that says like mentoring area, the people who are sitting there, you can always approach them. Don't be shy, come, they will be able to help you. If they can't help you, they probably know somebody who can help you and help you find this person, approach this person. So this was also something that was a wish from, from the mentees and that, that's been something that we had for hackathons ever since now. 
to have this designated mentoring area where people can come and we also want everybody's welcome to come in, ask questions, connect to us. So by and large, like what we learned is like it's really worth looking outside of your own, you know, little bubble for inspiration if you have facing challenges that you can't solve. So learning from other um, open communities was so, so helpful. That it's good to be bold, to try new ideas, even though people might be skeptical, because of course it takes a lot of resources. So I had to have really tough conversations with the Wikimedia Foundation for staff time assigned to the mentoring program. You have to convince volunteers to do it. But if, if you're convinced of it and you saw it working somewhere else and you really want to do it, like be bold, fight for it, try to get it through. Um, and it takes time, commitment, and resources. So onboarding newcomers is nothing that you can just do on the fly. I think we all, like, if it's important for us, if it's a priority, we also need to treat it as a priority. We need to put the resources in that are needed to do it properly. And cherish the mentors for their work. Like, we, we did everything to um, make the mentors the, the rock stars of this, um, of this event. Like, they got their own t-shirts, they got shout-outs, they get their own flowers. So, um, also cherish the newcomers, but also cherish the people who uh, work with these newcomers who dedicate their time and make it a successful event for everybody. So that was really, really good. And one of the most important, and that's probably also uh, one of the biggest arguments for things like um, mentoring programs, is that productivity and inclusiveness are not zero-sum games. We had both, because everybody else, they could work on their projects. They didn't have to, like everybody was not a mentor and didn't want to be, they could work on their projects. Um, and didn't have to be disturbed all the time, whereas the others could work together systematically and also produce a lot. So we had one of the longest showcases in the history of Wikimedia hackathons because on both sides people could work productively and it was just, um, yeah, it was, it was really nice. So, but what apart from events? Because events are things that happen one, two or three times um, a year. That's okay, that's a good start, but it's not enough. So uh, what we do ever since, we really try to pay attention to friendly spaces um, also outside of events. You have to create, like, create these events um, as friendly spaces, but um, online and offline communication um, outside of the major events should also be friendly spaces. Um, the way we communicate with, with each other, the way we treat each other, so for us at Wikimedia Austria, for us, every event now has a friendly space policy, for example. Uh, we also made sure to link our friendly space policy to our bylaws to make sure that it's also an obligation of everybody who is a member of our association to abide to that. Um, and another important thing that uh, goes with um, friendly space and inclusiveness is inclusive language. So we just had our bylaws and all official documents in inclusive language, which is important and even more so in German than in English, so I, I, I'm not sure what's your native language. Some of you might um, know what I'm talking about in English. It's not always as clear how important gendered language can be to, to be inclusive, um, but German is a heavily gendered language, so it, it really makes a difference. But uh, it goes beyond gendered language. Inclusive language is also calling Wikimedia projects not the German Wikipedia or the English Wikipedia, but the English language Wikipedia or the German language Wikipedia to uh, acknowledge that it has been, you know, created not only by Germans or by uh, people from England, but people from all over the world who speak the language and contributed to it. Um, inclusive language also means um, not using abbreviations without explaining them when you're aware that there are people around who might not understand it, to make insider jokes, but also give an explanation for that. So there are so many ways that our language can foster inclusion. Um, and uh, it, it's a process, like, um, and I myself, um, totally like uh, also go in the same traps but um, being aware of it and try to train yourself to be more inclusive in the way you talk with each other um, is definitely rewarding and first and foremost the, the, the thing that we took away from that and that we still want to do outside of hackathons and events is like um, redefine who are the rock stars in our movement the, the rock stars in our movement so far are the people with the big edit counts um, who have thousands of edits or uploads or um, I don't know, like made this or that big well-known project, the inventor of Wiki Loves Monuments. Um, and that's good, like these people should be rock stars, but mentors should also be rock stars. Even if there's no easy tool that we can program that counts how many people are in this movement because of them, 
to count how many people stayed in the movement because of them, to count how many people do a better job in this movement because of them. Yeah? But uh, I always try to imagine, if I know some, like the, some of the mentors and what they're doing behind the scenes, I always try to imagine that army of people behind them when they're walking around, like just like an augmented reality bubble where you have all these people that have something to say thank you for to this person. And I think we should celebrate that. We should celebrate that more. We should give these people more of a voice. We should acknowledge what they do, and we should celebrate them just as much as everybody with thousands and thousands of edits. So what does that all mean for the KDE or KDE community? Um, I think um, you guys are far ahead of us in many regards when it comes to all these cultural, um, all these cu cultural requirements that make a welcoming community. As I said, I talked a bit to um, Lydia before, and, and she told me that um, a constructive work, working atmosphere has been there from day one, and it was always something that has been cherished in this movement. Um, and it's still there. Like, uh, I mean, you have this strategic goals, these three strategic goals, and um, I just stumbled over I already knew it also from my conversation with Lydia, but I stumbled across that the last couple of days when I prepared my slides and uh, Lydia was asking like what were your highlights of the last year and there is um, Neophytos, I hope I pronounced the name right, um, who's saying like oh as a newcomer I submitted like one of these three goals um, and I've been working on it ever since and this is amazing and I showed that to a couple of people um, and from the Wikiverse and everybody said this would not be possible in the Wikiverse. Like having a newcomer coming in and like uh, defining and being chosen was like a strategic goal. And the strategic goal is also about onboarding. It makes it even better. But just that, that that's such a strong signal. That, that's amazing. So we are far away from, from being where you are. Also this, like embracing cuteness. So, um, uh, so, yeah, please. <laughs> because we have cuteness too, so I brought a representative here, it's Percy. So uh, cute animals are taking over the Wikiverse, have been for the last five years, there's a Wikimedia Cuteness Association, but we're far from, you know, embracing um, official uh, cute uh, um, animals as, as our uh, representatives to the outside world. So I find that really, really cool. I wish we had something like that. Um, and they're becoming more diverse too. And like every sub-community or sub-topic has their own um, little dragon. That's amazing. So you have it already. And I think you can make more out of it. Make it your USP. So USP is slang. This is exactly the kind of non-inclusive language. That's why I explain it. Um, I'm a marketing person, but it's a, it's a good term to um, explain like what I mean. It's like a factor that differentiates you from others. So being a welcoming community, that's such a big asset. And I think it needs to be even more prominent in, in what you do, because there are so many communities out there. They're looking for new people and want to convince people that it's worthwhile working for them. And you already have such great structures to have these people around. So make even more of it. Make that your USP that differentiates you from other communities and make people want to work with you instead of others. So well, how could that work? So I, I, I'm a newbie, but in this community I feel comfortable talking and making suggestions. So in the Wikiverse I would probably be slapped, but um, I make uh, one or two suggestions um, what, what could be done just from, from my very limited perspective. But I heard you have awards, um, and every now and then people get awarded for being great mentors or for being great people who onboard. How about having our own category for that? So just to make sure that at least once a year, somebody or a group of persons or people is appreciated for being great mentors, for great onboarders, for great newbie uh, recruiters. Um, that, that, that would be a start. And what's even more important, uh, give these people a voice and uh, a stage. Like, redefine who rock stars are. I think you're already in the process of that, that people who onboard um, newcomers um, are important to this community and should be cherished and should be able to, um, to get a prominent status. Um, but also give them a voice and a stage. Uh, that can mean regular blog posts about these things on, on your communication channels. That means 
I don't know, in, in programs, like in, in your uh, conference programs, make it our own slot. Whatever you can do to make these voices, these stories heard um, and shared, that will make it even more obvious and even more a signal for newcomers who look around for things that they can do to make it clear what you already are, a nice and welcoming um, community. So I think there's not much to do, but um, it could be a bit more systematic and even a stronger signal to the outside world, to people who don't have that background information or a nice chat to media, to make it really visible on first glance what's possible if you join if you join this community. Here are the resources. I will share these um, slides online, I guess. There will be a way to do that. I'm happy to do that. So this is everything we collected for hackathons. So that's probably another thing that you might uh, want to look into if you organize events. There are like a lot of big and small things that could probably be adopted, just like we adopted them from others. Um, and I would be happy if you would, yeah, also make a documentation of the things you're going to learn um, in the context of your strategic goal of onboarding newbies because I'm eager to learn and I think the Wikiverse can learn a lot from you. So wherever you create resources, let us know. Um, and otherwise, that's my, um, my contact. I'm happy to answer questions now or at any time in the future. And thanks again for having me and um, listening to me. Thanks. Thank you. I agree with the term rock stars, and I was actually hesitating whether I should. And I was also thinking very long about the pictures I use for, uh, for the slides when I pre uh, presented it, because I agree. Um, it's probably not the best term, but to get across the idea, I, ch I, I decided to stick with it, because just to make sure like how important these people are, I, I couldn't come up with a better term to acknowledge the importance. But within the community, to, to come up with like good terms on how we um, celebrate these people without our communities, we can come up with alternative terms that everybody, at least in the community, understands. But to talk to an audience to explain what I mean, I, I decided to stick with it. But I completely agree that um, it's probably not the best term in the world. Thank you. Thank you for, also for the recommendation. I will have a look at that book.
in this, yeah, in this uh, post fact world? I, I still don't think we live in a post fact world, also the, the slides said that, that, like, I'm um, hopefully not, but I, I, I know what you mean, like, that, does it still work in, like, this? in these times where this is very much challenged. And um, actually, I don't know, we all don't know yet, because what, what we are seeing right now is that people redirect um, their problems to Wikipedia, right? Like YouTube did, for example, Facebook does to a certain extent, Twitter, like, oh, uh, if you want to validate whether something is right or not, just go to Wikipedia. So yeah, nice, thanks guys, um, just send all the trolls our way, um, without, ever, <laughs> without ever giving back to us, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> Yeah, there have been a, a couple of interviews also with Catherine Mayer, the di uh, director of Wikimedia Foundation. It's even more in, in, in there because you have to look at it from a more global level. But there's, there's concern in the communities and there's concern in the organizations that um, the more uh, Wikipedia is also put into the limelight um, for, for those people, the more they will think about creative ways to bypass our quality control systems that we have. And I think it also always depends very much on the community and the project we're talking about. The German language community is like a big community with a lot of people, with a lot of mechanisms to ensure quality. Smaller languages with fewer editors, they're probably already struggling with that now. So um, it, it really depends from project to project. But we see, we see problems on the horizon that might challenge the way we work so far. The more people actually think like, oh, that's the last, uh, that's the last, um, uh, uh, how do you say, like the last threshold of, uh, of sourced information, let's, let's work uh, against that. Um, it is possible and um, we have our concerns. So we have, will need to see what the future brings for us and how our communities um, will deal with it. But we are aware of it, at least, so we're working on it. But there's no definite answer I can give to that right now. I can hear you, but I'm very close to you. There, yeah. uh, in the U.S. Uh, a few years ago, Stephen Colbert, a late night media, did a uh, oh, you can't trust Wikipedia just thing, and he had everybody change. I don't know. Yeah. Elephants. Yes. And it was really different. So, and that was his point. He wanted to make a point of that. That the facts are so fast and treat it as because, uh, you know, like we've already been, and it's true, Austrian language and Austrian culture is marginalized on the German language Wikipedia already. Um, and I'm not very trustful that if you just say, like, okay, let's not have Wikimedia Austria, that it will get any better. Um, if we don't have, like, a local organization that works with, I don't know, for example, the Federal Monuments Office to help um, uh, digitalize Austrian cultural heritage in a very systematic way. I think we do all of that from Berlin. I don't think it will get better. And even in Germany, you can see that there is a trend for re regionalization. Like you have like all these um, local Wikimedia offices that pop up. They're usually not staffed, but at least they have like some physical space because even Germany seems to be already too big to only have like one office um, in in um, in Berlin. So having a physical representation definitely helps. Whether it's called Wikimedia Austria or Wikimedia Germany, that's of course debatable. But I think um, having um, a representation, a physical space, and also people who actually work for exactly this part of marginalized 
content um, is, is still important. The, the question is like to what extent do we need that, um, how much we, and that's something we're thinking about it at the moment. We're, we're going through a huge movement wide strategy process and questions like that are on the table, like how many organizations do we need to support one language Wikipedia. But um, Wikipedia is also one of the, only one of the things that we do. There are other things regarding free knowledge that we do in Austria, and this is like one very important part, but not all of the things we do. But it's a very good question, thanks. Um, with respect to Wikipedia, I found out that the English language Wikipedia community seems to be very much open and, and very uh, much more uh, approaching to real topics, where in the German language uh, Wikipedia, I usually refrain from, from people reading the German language articles because there was very often that many of French people is generally going on and uh, not very much diversity in the regards of the German Wikipedia community. Are there people around so you might like me to or to, to, to form such a community to, to improve on that terms? Uh, the, the German language Wikipedia is a huge, huge um, challenge in that regard and if we try to find and recruit um, newcomers that's one of the biggest problems. We can make a nice LTGP event with editing and then once they're on their own on the Wikipedia there's really little we can do to, um, to support them because the more we as um, staff members try to uh, um, be involved the harder it gets actually. Um, but there are groups who, who um, work on, on, on projects like that, often internationally. I don't know how much they do in the German Wikipedia, but I'm happy to get you in touch with, like, um, and actually it's um, part, uh, a partly Austrian project. Um, just last week there was the Euro Pride in Stockholm, and it's like since last year it's a tradition to have, like, it, it came out of a project that we called Wikipedia for Peace, and um, LTGP topics were a, a really big part of um, uh, um, of, of Wikipedia for Peace for, for many reasons and there's a little international group that is like led from one Austrian who also invented Wikipedia for Peace that do these uh, Euro Pride events, the Dittetons for example and he's also working in the German um, Wikipedia of course so I'm happy to get in touch with him and, um, and this group, um, I, I think they do amazing work um, internationally but also in, in the German language. Next year we have Euro Pride in Vienna. I know. We will have an event like that here too, probably even a bit bigger. So, um, uh, and also Wikimedia Austria already um, uh, offered to um, to help organizing it and, and hosting it. So, if you would be part of it, that would be great. So, if we see each other next year again here in Vienna for that. Hi. Hi. Thank you again for the great job. I'm the guy from the website. Not really outside of events. So for like closed event, it's always easier to track. Like, oh, this was the mentor. This was this group. What did they do during the event? What did they do after the event? For the ongoing work during the year, it's really hard. And I think that's something that um, that will be the next step for us too to come up with good ways to measure. Um, we're not there yet. I can't, uh, unfortunately. But we should stay in touch. Perhaps you can come up with, and, and you know, especially in tech space, it's even harder. Like on Wikimedia projects, it's easier to keep track of what people do. Um, on tech projects, it's even, you know, it's so widespread. It can be GitHub or Wikidata or Fabricator. Like, where do you start? Like, and there is no good way so far that we can come up with. But I'm happy to have that conversation in future to, to learn from each other. Thank you so much. I think we are Yeah, and um, just reach out to me if um, if I can help with anything. Thank you so much. Thank you.